Small business is about courage, risk-taking, independence, and we small business owners are survivors. Everybody has an idea for a business, but how do you take that idea from mind to market? This is the place to learn. Small Business School with Hattie Bryant. It's a new kind of school. Together we'll learn about business from the inside out, from the people who've done it. We'll meet the men and women who are today's pioneers and quiet heroes. Their lives are the textbooks. Our classroom is the world. Hi, I'm Hattie Bryant. Business is not about greed. It's about value and value creation. And this show is always looking for people who create products and services that inculcate the highest values of humanity. So much of small business is about food, clothing, and shelter. But the big future for us is not in these highly competitive markets, often the domain of big business. Our future is in the individuation market. Uniqueness, higher perfections, the best of the best, aesthetics, making it more beautiful than was thought possible to be. Today, we enter into the future of small business. And it may surprise you that at the front edge are artists, people who see what cannot be seen, people who hear what has never been heard before, people who think not just outside the box, but about new boxes. There is a deep-seated interiority where the boxes are tetrahedrons and octahedrons and where simplicity meets complexity and where we see our world and ourselves in new ways. Ken Duncan started taking pictures to feed our souls, so maybe his business is about food. Let's go just north of Sydney, Australia to meet a prolific photographer who will teach us about the art of business and the business of art. Well, art to me is capturing the beauty of God's creation. That's to me, you know, and it's something outside of you that you tap into. Time tells what true art is because, you know, true art transcends time. How could you be stressed about life when you're sitting there? I mean, Ken Duncan is founder of what today includes five galleries and a profitable website that sell his amazing photography a custom framing company, a publishing house, and one of the most modern printing laboratories in the world. The art can be purchased as very large limited edition prints or in breathtaking collections published in book form and on DVD. With a team of 54 employees, he and his wife Pam love working in and working on the business they started in 1980. Well, our vision statement is to show the beauty of God's creation. That's it. I just want to open people up to the potential of bigger pictures. All I'm trying to say is, hey, look, there's something out there maybe bigger than us. When you're out in these wonderful places, the less of you, the more you can sense God's awesome creation mm -hmm. and his anointing. Now, not every photo of mine has that anointing, but every now and then God gives me these little gifts, you know, just to humble me. give our viewers who'd like to take pictures a little photography lesson. Well, the best photography lesson is get out of bed. And <laughs> <laughs> because man, there's you mean no because it's in the morning? Yeah, not many people are out there at sunrise. You know, if you want to take photos, it's the best time because most people are still thinking, well, maybe one day I'll get out of bed and take a photo. And hopefully, as the sun comes up, the weather's going to be awesome. Praise God. <laughs> Let's try to understand how Mr. Duncan achieves his distinctive look. It's low tech in the field. He shoots film, big film. He coined and trademarked the word panograph, which is a panoramic photograph by Ken Duncan, a wide shot capturing the essence of a place at a particular point in time. Mr. Duncan reflects back to the late 70s. Well, in those days, no one was doing wide because they said, it doesn't fit in a book, it doesn't fit on a television, you know. Well, I thought, well, why can't they change the book? You know, we need to get the book wider, you know. Because I love the format, because that's the way we see. We see in panorama. 
Ken's main camera is a Linhoff 617S3 with three interchangeable lenses, 180, 90, and 72 millimeters. 1,000, 2,000. It uses 120 roll film and gives four shots to a roll with an image size of six by 17 centimeters. He prefers high-tech filters, a Sekonic light meter, and Fuji film. Dominated by its famous Harbour Bridge and Opera House, Sydney is without doubt one of the most beautiful cities in the world. As the day dawns, Sydney slowly shakes the slumber of night. The harbour has had minimal traffic throughout the night and its mirrored surface reflects the glory of the coming day. It's fun when you're taking photographs because it's like a, um, a play happening before you. It's just you're sitting there and just things are happening and the clouds are floating by, the moon's changing position, the light's changing. The reason most people don't get some of the good pictures is because they're just not prepared to wait. <laughs> Everybody wants it here and now. Spending hours and hours to set up and sometimes days waiting for the right conditions, today, Ken does not put his work in the hands of others. I was disappointed when I did my first book with the way the publishers did it. I felt the result wasn't good. Everybody else seemed to be happy with it, but I wasn't, because I, and, and their attitude was, well, people don't really know what quality is. You know, it's all about price. And I thought, wrong. People do know what quality is about, and I don't want to be associated with just quality at a price. I want to do the best. And they said, oh, well, you know. And in the end, I thought, I'm going to do it myself. So I thought, we'll publish books. Taking control of the publishing was important, but even more critical to the quality was to take control of the film. Yeah, we're going to take you down to see where we make all these things. Yeah, it's fun. At his own lab that does work for other photographers as well, Ken is like a proud father. Natasha runs a great team down here. She's um, been with us for a long time. She's putting the transparency or the original uh, chrome or slide, some people call them onto a drum so that it can be scanned and turned into digital information and she's done that with using oil to oil mount it uh, so that you get a really smooth surface and you get a very good uh, high-end scan that, that really shows your highlights and also your shadow detail. If you're using flatbed scanners you won't get the same sort of detail that you'll get in a high-end drum scan. Also you'll get much better sharpness uh, with the other scanners they tend to sort of try and recreate the sharpness by using uh, electronic means, whereas it's best to get as sharp as you can so you get every bit of quality out of it you can. Not many labs do this because they don't want to spend the time oil mounting or, or doing high-end files. They want to try and give a client the quickest result and they think that people don't care about quality. But for us, we want the best. And you've got to be very careful when you put them on the drum because that transparency can be worth a couple of hundred thousand dollars. Why is that transparency worth $200,000? Well, a limited edition print, which has, say, got 300 prints at an average price of $1,000, there's $300,000 just alone without any other usages. So now she's going to take it from there, and uh, that's the mounting area, and we take it over to um, the high-end drum scanner. Now, this spins at very high speed, and this uh, reads all the information it scans it. So I still use film to capture the images because I still love the beauty of film. But with digital, it makes it, you know, you can really control what you're getting. Um, you can really control the color and the sharpness and also the repeatability because when people see a print, they want to get the exact same thing again. Also making sure that the colors are right. Now when they come in, sometimes they can come in a bit flat, the scans, but what we, we try and do is we try and get it in as clean as possible and then uh, adjust the colour in um, Photoshop later on to get it back to where we need the colour. And this is where often we'll talk a lot and then we'll say, yep, that's great, or no, you know, that's not right. 
because I was there. So. So you think this is the color of the sunflowers that you saw, Ken? Well, this, they're looking bright. That, that's pretty well as it is. Actually, when you see the print, it'll be even more like that, I think. Oh, it's a big bit of paper we've got there, mate. You've got to do it the best possible. Use the best mediums because you need that wow factor in a print. It's the wow factor that sells things. And when people see these prints that are just really colourful and really real, they just go, when you show them, they go, wow. And you know, once they go, wow, you know, they're pretty well on the way to wanting to have one on their wall. So, uh, whereas a lot of other people have tried to do it on, on lesser quality. And if you add enough of those lesser qualities together, when they open their print, and I open my print, you know, the one they're gonna buy is the one we show them. It is beautiful. Through the years, Ken Duncan has shown so much to so many. He takes us to places we may not be able to go ourselves. Starting with the landscape of his own country, we learn from these pictures that the continent of Australia is spectacular. It's the land that links us. You know, we've got to wake up. We've got to realize we're on a journey together. And we can have the adventure of a lifetime if we start to realize we're all on the same boat. Waterways remind me of God's love for us. Pure, freely given, unconditional, utterly life-giving. Our lives are truly small compared with the vast world around us. We are linked with this land. If we take the time to enjoy it, it will nourish our souls. So Ken, when was the first time you realized that you could take a picture? Um, well, when I was young, my dad used to take so long taking photographs that if someone didn't do something, we would have spent our whole life behind a camera all going, come on, dad, you know, like, so my lovely dad, but he just was, photography just was not his calling. So I sort of commandeered the, the family camera to get the thing over and done with quicker. So that's how I started. About 16, I really found out more about photography and I fell in love with photography. And uh, after that, to the detriment of my schoolwork, I just love taking photos. I was shy when I was a kid. I loved it with a camera, because with a camera you could go right up to a girl and look right into her eyes or into any person or situation. You always had a reason to be there. No one would ever question what you're doing there, so you'd get to see life far grander than just seeing it from one little perspective. When was the first time someone actually bought a picture? Well, I had to start at a very early age, because my mum and dad, they were lovely people, but they weren't well off. And they said, son, if you're wanting to do this photography, you're going to have to make it pay because we can't afford all of this stuff. So my mum's, you know, like laundry was turned into a dark room. And uh, so I would take photos of all the good looking guys and sell it to the good looking girls and the good looking girls to the good looking guys. So I learned very young age, to, I had to make money out of it. So I just did that. I wasn't brought up in a family with rejection. I had a mother who always said, you can do anything you want to and I, you know I was stupid enough to believe it <laughs> so that was one of the things that really helped me you see a lot of people don't succeed because they take things too personally a lot of photographers they're too scared to go and show people their work because they're scared that people might say I don't like it when I left school my teacher said to me you are the least likely person to succeed after I left school I thought well I'll show you attitude and um, so I went off trying to pursue the great Australian dream, which is probably very close to the great American dream, of having a house, of, uh, you know, possessions, fast cars, money and all this sort of stuff, and uh, a wife and 2.5 children. <laughs> now, I, didn't, I had all the rest, but I wasn't very happy, and I wasn't prepared to go for the wife and 2.5 children, because, you know, the rest wasn't working, so... Okay, I, so you had the car, the house, the successful business... Making lots of You had of the money. clothes, you had money, and that was all from photography? All from photography, because I was selling photography. I was in selling equipment, you know, high-end photographic equipment. So I turned my love into a means of making money. Okay. And the trouble with that is, you know, if you turn your passion into just a, a stream of making money, you can lose your passion. And, and I began to lose my passion. I was talking photography rather than taking photography. It's good to read um, your shadow and then your highlight. So then you do in between that. I took this camera that we'd uh, imported from overseas, a panoramic camera, and I took it over to Bali on a surfing holiday.
So you were surfing? Yeah, I love to surf, you know. And uh, we were over there for some big waves and I took, one day when I was out in the water, I saw this big mountain called Mount Agung. And I thought, man, I've got to climb that thing, you know. Mm -hmm. And the mountain was like 10 and a half thousand feet high. So it was quite a mountain. And, uh, but it was quite an adventure. We got up there for sunrise and we shot, it was just clear all the way off the, down this island and I could just, I took this photograph with this camera and uh, I said, well God, if you're real, you know, it'd be really good to get a bit of help because this money thing's not really doing it for me. And just, you know, casual question. But when I came back, I had a photo from that and it rekindled my love for photography. I thought, this is what I've been looking for. What have I been doing, you know? I've got to get back to taking photos. So when I came back, I decided that's it. I'm selling everything and I'm going bush. I've got to find a meaning to life. There's got to be more than this and I'm going to take my camera, this new camera, and uh, photograph Australia. So that's how the journey started. But the journey wasn't just about making money. It was about I had to find a meaning to life. Carrying a rifle to hunt for his food and a camera to capture the beauty, Ken lived in the outback with the aboriginals. After three years, with no prior contacts, referrals, or guarantees, it was time to take his work to New York City. And then all of a sudden there's this phone call, and the directors of this gallery called the Light Gallery, they rang up and said, oh, can you please come down quickly? We'd love to see you. We love your work. And I'm thinking, oh, OK. Great. <laughs> so I came down there, and they were really happy with my work. And, so they all of a sudden wanted to make me a star sort of thing. Yeah. And I'm going, so they're sending me to all these magazines and all this stuff. But the thing is that when I was there, I met someone in the center of photography and he was very important to me. And he said, Ken, watch out with New York. He said, because what you're doing is very different. Be very careful they don't try and turn you into another one of their photographers. And what happened is I really, I got, wound up like a clock right. <laughs> with New York and all of these things and they sent me back to Australia and when I hit Australia my feet were running so fast I was just about falling over myself. I had an assignment to do Mel Gibson, I did all these assignments for National Geographic and I'm like, I, all of a sudden I get here and I think, I get out bush and I think, I don't want to do this, what am I doing, you know? And I remembered with these words that this man had said, just stay true to your destiny, stay true to what you're doing. And so I rang them all up and said, look, thank you very much for all these assignments, but, you know, I don't really want them. And they're going, you're kidding. People kill for these assignments. I said, well, I don't. You know, thank you. I'm really appreciative, but I just want to go bush again and do what I was doing. And uh, I'm going to get back out there and see, you know, finish this. I'm not there yet. So uh, the, to finance this, I had one last thing. I had my house. And I thought, I've got to sell that too, you know, mm -hmm. because... I think with any journey, often we've got to give more than 100%. You can't just give 50%. And often we, that's all we do. We, we put in 50% and it doesn't work. We think, oh, that's it, I'm out of here. I, I can't lose my other 50%. But it's that 50% that can make the whole project work, you know? Sure. And for me, I actually put in more than my 100% because in the end, that whole project took me all my money and I had to borrow some more. <laughs> <laughs> But really, my whole business started with me having a portfolio and a bag of prints, and I'd knock on doors. Okay. And you know, people often say, well, how do you start? And I say, that's how you start. You just knock on doors. And the thing is, out of those doors, you've got to realise it's all about numbers. One out, of ten's go one out of ten's going to say yes, and the other nine are going to say things like, for a photograph, or you've got to be kidding, <laughs> and, but you can't take it personally. When I believe God gives you an idea because he wants you to do it, you know, not to palm it off to someone else because, you know, when you do that, you're passing away the profit. So it's very important to take control of your destiny in that way and believe that, you know, God has given that vision for a purpose for you to fulfill it. Right. Now, when we did our first exhibition, no one had ever done these exhibitions in Australia before. So we booked out a five-star hotel and it cost us every bit of money, we had to borrow money to do this thing. And so if it hadn't succeeded, we would have been bankrupt right there. Mm -hmm. but we just really believed it would work. And that exhibition was hugely successful. Like we sold uh, over a hundred prints or something like that, and a thousand books or something like this. And we're going, wow, so that's how it all started. And you know, but it was, you gotta take risks. And at this stage, I, you know, I'd become a Christian and I very much felt that 
I wasn't on my own and that I had a God looking after me. So that made it a lot easier to, to take risks. Five um, physical studios, a lot of inventory, um, now your own printing presses, your own laboratory. How have you financed the growth of the business? Well, the business, you know, has financed the business. Uh, although, every now and then, we've had to do steps beyond the, you know, our comfort level. I believe every now and then you're pushed outside your comfort level. Right. Now, a project we did was America Wide, a book on America. So I gave it to the publishers in New York, and they say, well, Ken, yeah, we'd love to do a book with you, because um, I'd done other book projects. And they said, uh, they said, what's the title going to be? And I said, it's going to be called America Wide and God We Trust. And they said, well, we love the America Wide, but the In God We Trust is far too political. Right. And I said, look, you can't get rid of the In God We Trust. That's the important part, you know. <laughs> yeah. That's the strength of America, that it does trust in God. And they're saying, well, it's politically incorrect. And I thought, I can't do this book with them because they're going to kill the words. They're going to turn it into just another book. So I said, look, thank you very much, but I'm just obviously going to have to do it myself. And you know, that book was launched four days before September the 11th. And now, the book was given to George Bush the day before by our own Prime Minister. But it gave America a chance to look at how wonderful their nation is, and at that time they needed to gain strength. It took three years for Ken Duncan to take the panographs found in America Wide. I've been to many of these places myself, but when I look at the book, I am remembering his advice to all of us. Step back and see the big picture to balance your life, to see what's really important. Tell yourself, step back and see the big picture. The important thing is a lot of people can't go to the places I go to because they're so busy, they're caught up. And what I'm trying to do is rather than try and grab them and take them out there, I'm trying to bring the beauty of creation into them. Because I believe as they see that, it will minister to their spirit. I have journeyed throughout this land on a three-year pilgrimage, endeavouring to capture the spirit of America. At Gettysburg on July 3rd, 1863, more than 5,000 soldiers fell in one hour. An eerie presence still lingers as the sun rises over the fields. Cries of anguish from the past seem to echo in the haze. Every now and then my wife puts me on ideas bands. She says, you're not allowed to have any more ideas for a year. And it was so funny because she couldn't stop me having the ideas. So when the ideas ban stopped, all of a sudden I had two years worth of ideas <laughs> all in one hit. So what does it take to make a business work and to stay fresh? You've been doing this now? Oh, since 1980, yeah. 1980? Yeah. Really. All right. Well, to stay fresh is don't get comfortable. <laughs> Comfort, I believe, is the biggest killer on the journey of life. We get a little niche and, you know, we turn it into... Now, that's OK for some people, but for me, life's an adventure, not creating little comfort, you know, ponds. Because I don't believe they, they become... They stay comfortable, you know, you just sort of... They lock you. I think when I go old, I don't want to say, if only I had of. I, I, I want to say, well, I gave it a go, and man, that was a real adventure, I've got to tell you. You know, I, at least if I fail or succeed, it doesn't matter, because at least I gave it a go. On my journey of trying to find a meaning to life, I found it. And the meaning to life is this, is that the only thing you take with you when you die is the wealth in your spirit. Most business owners we study on this show lead with quality because we all know that small business can't be price driven. Ken Duncan is teaching us that quality to the nth degree is what we have to give our clients. His photos may be just photos, but by stretching for perfection, he transformed photos into art. If you take the challenge to be all you can be and inspire all those around you to be their best, is it possible that you, in your reach for an even higher perfection, can transform your work into art? I think so.
Small Business School with Hattie Bryant. If you want to learn more about starting, running, and growing a business, come to our website, smallbusinessschool.org. There are streaming video and interactive study guides. The only way we can compete with big business is to be faster, smarter, and better. We are the engine of the American economy. We create the jobs. Small business is about big commitment. It's about sacrifice and struggle. But we do it because we say, if I don't do this, my life won't be complete.